talk this evening is on the very inspiring, uplifting, amazing subject of death. <laughs> and end of life issues. And what is really, really nice being a Buddhist is if you don't die well this time, you always have a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance, as many chances as you ha want. You get reincarnated until you learn how to die properly. <laughs> it's just like when you go to university, you get uh, your exams. If you don't f pass the first time, you can get another try. And another try and another try and another try until you do it right. So please, if you can learn how to do it right this time, then you won't need to get reborn again. And just, what are these people up to? Oh, getting some more spaces here. So it's part of your life as a monk to look after people when they're dying and during their death process and also after their death process when they are ghosts. So I'm going to tell all sorts of stories, you know, from when a person's about to die until afterwards. And I'm going to start with um, a story of a um, friend of mine, he was a, a fellow monk, and even though he was an Oxford Road scholar and I was from Cambridge, I never held that against him. <laughs> Oxford and Cambridge are always at war with one another. But, he got really sick. So, he actually had two types of typhoid at the same time. Now, the two strains. And he was in this forest monastery with me in the northeast of Thailand. And he was really fortunate that a visitor one day was a doctor who just happened to pass through the monastery. We asked him to have a look at this monk and he said, get him to Bangkok immediately. And so the only way to get him to Bangkok to get some medical attention was the overnight train. And so he, you know, we got first class compartment for him so he could have him take a rest. And the doctor had asked his friends, because this really was an emergency, to have an ambulance waiting on the platform of the uh, st station in Bangkok. You know, this huge, the, um, busy, so to get that permission was amazing. And he said because it was really life and death. And later on I spoke to the doctor who was in that ambulance who received this monk, and he told me when he took one look at this monk, he was such, in such deep shock, he thought never get him to the hospital in time, he'll die in the journey. And he told me that's how close it was, but it was tough enough, he managed to get to the hospital, and of course, once you're in the hospital getting all sorts of great treatment, you know, he survived, sort of. But what happened to him was, you know, the effects of you know, coming that close to death knocked his body around so much he was sick for the next three or four years. So sick that when I went to see him, we sent him to our monasteries in England thinking he'd get better treatment there. Every possible treatment you could get, we tried to get for him. But he never got better. I went to visit him once and he was in this there's a monastery, Chittos, if ever you've been there in England, and he was in the attic room. And just like in those old novels, like Jane Eyre, you know, you put all the crazy mad people in the rooms up in the attic. And that's what it was like with this monk, this dingy dark room up in the attic. And he was so sick he could never even get out of the attic room. On a good day, he told me, he could actually just about get out of bed he you know, stagger to the door and realise he hadn't got any energy left and crawl back into bed. And that was for three or four years he was like that. And every treatment didn't work until one day the head monk went up to this monk's room. He used to be a Rhodes Scholar, a champion wrestler in the United States, very strong, fit guy. And now he was just a shadow of his former self. And the head monk went up to this monk's room, just the head monk and this monk, and said to him, I have come up here on behalf of all the monks in this monastery 
all the male, female supporters and your family as well. I've come up here to give you permission to die. You don't have to get better. You can die if you want, stop trying to, to improve. At which point apparently this monk just burst out crying, wept and wept and wept, because he was trying so hard to get better. And once he didn't try to get better anymore, that's when he started to improve. That was about 20 years ago. He's alive and well right now. <laughs> and that was a brilliant piece of emotional intelligence. When someone is really sick, one of the reasons they can't recover is they're trying so hard to get better. So hard that it's making them sick. And that's what was happening with him. As long as he was given permission to die, it doesn't matter, he can die if he wants to, he could relax. And as soon as he relaxed, he started to improve and get better, that's why he's still alive. And I always remember that, that is actually number one, how to treat people if you're visiting them in hospital. When you're visiting your, your dear mother in hospital, tell her, Mama, Mother, it's okay to die, I'll give you permission to die. And she said, but, but I'm, only, I'm only in here for a cataract operation. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously they have to be really sick on the edge of death and give them permission. And from that time, I've used that many, many times and it's a wonderful thing to do at the end of life. Not when they're just having a cataract operation. <laughs> Mum, you can die if you want to. <laughs> but no. If it is at the end of life, I've seen this several times, because that's again part of my job, going visiting people at the last days of their life. And I always remember seeing um, Steve uh, and his uh, Buddhist wife, Jane. She still comes, so I think just uh, uh, last Friday, came to listen to the Friday night talk in Perth. And her husband, he, she was a, a nurse, Australian, husband was American, and he started this great business, white water rafting. And it was a, a dream business for young people because they would charge people and take them to some of the most scenic parts of the world and they'd arrange these great rafts and they'd go white water rafting you know, through the, the gorges, <coughs> through the canyons. You know, <coughs> great scenery and brilliant life and charge people for it. That's where they made their money from. And even though you think it was only about 27, 28 at the time, that was when he got cancer. Even young people get cancer. And it got so bad that you know, it became terminal and that's when I came in. And as soon as it became terminal, I came in. I would go and counsel him and see him you know, go in those final days of his life. But when I went to visit, something strange was happened. That you know, he wasn't dying. He was expected to die, you know, two days ago and they said probably today and he didn't die and then the next day he didn't die. And even though he was emaciated and obviously in great discomfort, he wasn't dying. And that's when I remembered this story, you know, from a monastery a long time ago. And I realised that that was a problem. And I looked to Jenny, his wife, and I asked her, you know, Steve was listening. I asked her, Jenny, have you given your husband permission to die yet? And she never said anything to me, because she understood, she got it straight away. She jumped on the bed. It's one of the most, I can see this now, one of those really beautiful moments in my monastic life. She jumped on the bed, held her husband in her arms, looked him in the eyes, you know, as one lover to another, wife to her husband, Say, Steve, it's okay, you can die. I give you permission. Stop trying so hard to keep alive for me. And that night he passed away. And you can understand the psychology of that. What is happening if you're really, really sick and you're close to death? If it's not conscious, if it's subconscious, you're trying so hard to keep alive because you don't want to hurt the people you love the most. You know it's going to break their heart when you die, so you're trying everything to keep alive. 
just prolonging the agony of, and discomfort of the dying process. So, when I tell that story, and many people have practiced that since, if you have a mother, father, grandma or someone, someone who's really, really sick, when it gets to that point and the doctors say, look, there's no real hope anymore, they're going to go, out of kindness, compassion for them, please go up to them and tell them privately, Mum, it's okay, you can die, I give you permission to die. Stop struggling and trying so hard to keep alive for me. And it's a wonderful thing and you find that they die usually within 24 hours afterwards because the one thing which has pro been prolonging their life is their fear of the pain they're going to cause you. And that's really unfair. So, that becomes a major powerful way of helping people in those last hours of their life. Give them permission to die. They're going to die anyway. So when you give them permission to die, they die with less pain and with less discomfort. And of course, the, the other thing which I've noticed, uh, being with people who are dying, um, you, many of you may have seen this as well, that when you are dying, or when, not sorry, you're dying, when there is somebody in your family who's really close to death, have you always been around their bedside, you know, holding their hands, waiting for that last moment, you don't know when it is, you wait, 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 hour after hour, nothing seems to be happening. happening. You know, the, uh, uh, the uh, medication, what's it called now, the morphine, yeah, the morphine is just, uh, means they can't talk to you, they can't do anything, and on those last uh, hours of their life, you don't know when they're going to go, and then you think, we're feeling hungry, we'll just go out for a snack. And as soon as you go out that room for a snack, that's when they die. I've seen that so many times. And why does that happen so much? So put yourself in the dying person's place. You're around, and I'm going to say in a moment, even if you think they're on morphine, they can't hear you. Yes, they can, they can feel you. And dying is one of the most personal, private moments of your life. And it's so difficult to do when someone else is around. It's private, you need. It's a very, very sensitive and important moment. And if you have other people around, they're actually disturbing your dying process. So, if you really think it's time, get out of the room and let them die by themselves. As you would want to. Uh, I know that say, in Malaysia I did a little a workshop, that's I know, in Hong Kong. And in the workshop, just to make it, it was for the health professionals, to make it more interesting rather than just talking to people. I can't do it here, there's not enough space. I split the uh, group, maybe about 100 people, I paired them off, you know, find a partner, and your health professionals, you should be able to do this pretty quickly. You now choose one person A, the other person B, you know, give each other a letter, A and B. And once they paired off and assigned the letter A or B to one another, then I asked them, OK, the one who is A, I want you to, you know, in the next five minutes, choose your time in the next five minutes, to pretend you're having a cardiac arrest. You've probably seen that many times before. Act it out. You know, do the ooh, ooh, or whatever it is you do when you have a cardiac arrest, and fall to the ground. And the person B, just help them. And so they were doing, I think actually, I didn't, they didn't actually choose the time. I rang the bell. And as soon as the bell rang, <laughs> they had to have their pretend cardiac arrest. And they fell down to the ground, and the uh, person A, and person B, it was interesting, the response of, per, of, of person B. You know, they would you know, try to press their, their tummy, you know, to keep their heart going. They look in their eyes, stay with me, stay with me, keep eye contact, don't go, we're going to get an ambulance, keep with me. And it was very, very intrusive what the person B, the friend, did. Because afterwards, I asked the people A, the people who pretended to have a heart attack, who pretended to be dying, what did it feel like? And they said it was just so intrusive, it was just so, you no, know, I was trying to die. And these people were getting in my way, saying, stay with me, keep looking at me, an ambulance is coming, hold my hand, it's going to be all right. 
And all I really want to say is, shut up, I'm dying, be quiet. <laughs> and then we reverse the roles. And when the roles were reversed, and person B pretended to die, and person A was a carer, their response was totally different. They were like, hold on, it's okay, you can let go. You know, I give you permission to die, it's okay. And it was a far more um, sensitive and meaningful experience instead of trying desperately to keep a person alive. Because we live in a society where keeping people alive is more important than allowing them to die with peace, with grace, in their own way. And that is a big problem for us. This is where I keep telling people it's more important to care than to cure. The caring is more important. And so hopefully, if you get that message, if you are with someone who has an accident or some trauma or a heart attack or they're in the bed and they're about to die, please be calm and kind to them. Stop trying to intervene. And stop also um, crying and moaning, Oh, Mum, don't die. I can't live without you. Look, it's bad enough dealing with your own death and dealing with your relations, emotional problems, that's just really going over the top. So please, when somebody is dying, it's their time, give them space and freedom to actually do that. And if you can do that, if you can let them go with grace, with wisdom, with compassion, the whole death experience becomes so different. It's not something we're afraid of, which we try to stop at all costs. It is something which is part of life and can be one of the most beautiful parts of life. Or I should say, experiences of people who have been in a coma, under morphine, who, just before they die, wake up. Had so many experiences, so many, so many, um, experiences and also anecdotes of people waking up when they were supposed to be dying. The most recent, because I've been talking about this a long time, there's one of the doctors in Perth, he told me it happened to him. One of his patients, who was going to die you know, one day soon, you know, really started showing signs that the death process is accelerating faster than this doctor had thought. The doctor was by the bedside, saw the patient really falling away, fading away fast, and so uh, desperately tried to ring up all of the relations in the book as fast as possible to tell them to get to the hospital now. You know, your father is dying. And as he was ringing the daughter, you know, and got the name, Jenny or something, Jenny, come to the hospital quick, your father is dying. And then the father opened his eyes and said, tell Jenny I love her and then he closed his eyes and died. Jenny never made it. But just the last moment of life, you know, under heavy sedation, he became clear enough you know, to listen, hear the doctor telephoning the daughter next to the bed and to shout out to his daughter, you know, tell her I love her. And that was his last words. And then, poof, died. And of course that happened uh, another couple of disciples over in Perth you may have your stories as well. They were by the bedside of their father, holding his hand on either side of the bed. He had been in coma for a couple of days. You know, the breathing was getting laboured. You know, any breath could be the last breath. And they were there <coughs> a couple of hours, three hours, you know, not knowing what to do next. Then suddenly, he opened his eyes and he leant up from the bed looked around at his two daughters and they said, well, they said, really weird synchronicity, we love you dad. And he closed his eyes and fell back and died right there. Last moment of consciousness. And the best example of that, which I read, it was in Time magazine, it was an article by a, a doctor in, I think, New York somewhere. And he had a patient who had a brain tumour and the brain tumour was advancing at regular um, deterioration or uh, colonisation of the right brain, the proper brain cells. 
It was so regular that the doctor could actually plan out exactly what would happen to this patient at the moment he would die. You know, you know almost to the, you know, the half hour. And you know, that when the brain tumour was growing, colonising the good brain cells, he could predict, you know, this is what will happen next. He'll start to lose some of his bodily functions and then, you know, he'll be paralysed from the next down and then he'll be, uh, you know, you know this better than I, doctors, but, you know, then he will lose his uh, ability to speak, lose his ability to see, and all the, the function would, would, would uh, drop off one by one until just the, the most important bodily functions, the heart and obviously the brain, would be the last ones which would be working until they too would not have enough brain power to continue. And so he would die slowly, fade away into oblivion. And so because the doctor monitored progress and all the family were around, they knew who was going to go in the next half an hour. And that's when, according to the doctor, he said it shouldn't happen, but I saw it, it was amazing. He opened his eyes and he also leant up looked at all his family and had a nice conversation with them for about 20 minutes, you know, giving his last goodbyes to everybody at a time when basically all he had between his ears was a big tumour and no brain. So it shouldn't have happened, but it did. And told everybody, you know, the last uh, words before he passed away. And then he closed his eyes and died. And that reminded me of something which I know that your last moments of death, of life, are usually when the brain turns off but your mind actually continues. And for some people, even though the brain is no longer functioning, your mind is, and it can do these amazing things like lift your body up, open your eyes and even speak to people. And this was a man, you know, who hadn't spoken, this last experience, last uh, story, hadn't spoken for days. You know, he hadn't had that ability, he'd lost his memory power and everything. But the last few moments was clear, just as if, you know, he hadn't had any tumour at all. To me it's when the brain takes over. And I mention these stories for a particular purpose. Because as Buddhists, we've always heard that the last thoughts are the most important. They will determine more than anything else, where you will get reborn in your next life. So the last thoughts are that important that many Buddhists, they say, well, we don't want to take morphine, because if we take morphine, we won't know what our last thoughts are. You know, we'll be like drug to the eyeballs. We'll be so dull, you know, who knows where we might be reborn. We might be reborn like as a worm, like as a beetle, because we don't know what we're doing. We've got no mindfulness and awareness at all under morphine. So uh, some Buddhists say, I'm not going to take that. And they have a very painful discomfort death. And you don't need to do that even if you take the morphine. The last moments, the important ones, are clear. Even if you don't open your eyes and speak to your friends. When that death moment happens, your mind literally separates from the brain and the brain is what is drugged, it is a brain which is clouded, it is a brain which is not functioning clearly, but the mind does function clearly. Which means you can still have your beautiful last thoughts. And what are some of the best thoughts? It reminds me, because sometimes I get too serious and people fall asleep, but this is one of my lovely stories which was told to me by a fellow in Colombo. There was, Sri Lanka, there was a man who was a businessman in Gaul Road. And he was really into making as much money as possible. His wife was a devoted Buddhist. And the only time he ever went to the Buddhist monastery or temple was on Waisak Day. He is what we call Waisak Buddhist. And I'm sure there are many of them here. The only time you ever come to the BSV is on Waisak Day. So he was a Waisak Buddhist and he only went to the temple because his wife would just really scold him and give him a hard time if he didn't. So he went on Waisak to the temple and he was just really bored and having given food to the fat monks 
and then giving a donation. He wanted to keep the money himself, but he had to do this. And listening to boring, boring sermons. But this time the sermon was interesting. At least part of it was, because the priest, the monk, said, if you want to get a good rebirth, then all you need to do, all you need to do is to make sure your last thoughts are good ones. And the priest also said, some of the best thoughts would be to think of what we call the triple gem, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, just before you pass away. He said, that is a brilliant thought, guaranteed to go to heaven. And somebody asked, what do you mean, even if you don't keep precepts and you don't give donations? And he said, yeah, you know, if your last thought, that is really more important than anything else. And so this businessman, he got this idea. A light bulb went on in his mind. He said, how he can go to heaven without ever going to the temple again? Because you see, he had three sons. When he went back home, he renamed his son by deed poll. The eldest son he named Buddha. <laughs> the second son he named Dhamma. And the third son he named Sangha. Because he knew according to Sri Lankan tradition, maybe most traditions, at your deathbed, your sons will be by your deathbed. So he'd be seeing Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. He was bound to go to heaven. A really good plan. So from that day on, he never ever went to the temple again. He never gave any alms. He never gave any donations. He never kept any precepts. He just worked in his shop where he really loved making more and more money. And his, his sons helped him there. And of course, years went past. He eventually got sick like everybody has to. He was on his deathbed and his plan was working perfectly. There, next to his deathbed, were his three sons, obviously waiting for your father to die. And you know, his last half an hour, his last 15 minutes, he was looking, just you know, with the weakness of dying moments, but still with his eyes open, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I'm going to heaven. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I'm going to heaven. His plan was working perfectly. And then, saying Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, his three sons, suddenly he had a thought. And the thought was, if my three sons, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, are here by my bedside, who's looking after my shop? <laughs> and that's when he died. <laughs> and that's what happens. You can't beat the system. He was greedy all his life. He only thought of his shop all of his life. And no matter how much he tried to work the system to his advantage, he couldn't, the system beat him. If he th thought about his shop all his life, his last moment would just be about his shop. And he'd get reborn as one of those hungry ghosts, <laughs> always attached to stuff. So you cannot beat the system that way. If you want to have good thoughts, you don't have to worry about the morphine or not taking morphine or whatever, you still have a clear mind. And your last thoughts will be the way you thought all those last years of your life. You can't suddenly change. Which brings me up to another story. I don't think this happens in Sri Lanka, but there's a few people, Malaysian and Singaporeans, who always come here. And it was getting to be scandalous in Malaysia and Singapore when some of the evangelical Christians would actually force themselves, you know, they may be having this young man, this young woman who's one of their following, and when they heard <coughs> their father or grandfather or grandmother mother was about to die, they would all, including the pastor, go to this person's bedside. They were Buddhist. And the daughter would say, Grandpa, the daughter would say, Father, please convert to being a Christian. Because they believed, you know, really believed, stupidly believed, that if their father or mother, grandpa or grandma was a Buddhist, they would go to hell. And the only way they can go to heaven was to convert to being a Christian. And so they'd be by the bedside, harassing them, haranguing them, arguing, cajoling them, and their poor old grandpa was dying. That's the last thing you need when you're about to die. You know, saying, convert Christianity. You don't need a theological argument when you're dying. You just want a bit of comfort and a bit of love and kindness, whatever. But no one could stop them because you know, that was the, the daughter, the granddaughter. 
and it became such a problem that they asked me in Malaysia, Singapore, Ajahn Bam, can you help with some wise advice? You know, what should we do if we're that person in the bed dying and our daughter or son, you know, they love us, they've got the best wishes, but they're crazy. And they come up and tell us, Mummy, you must convert, I don't want you to go to hell and burn. <laughs> so what should I do? And I gave this wonderful advice, it's just so obvious, I can't see why other people can't see these things. I said, yeah, sure, so you're dying in your bed and you've only got a few hours or days to go and you're you know, crazy daughter or son who's converted to this really extreme form of Christianity comes to your bedside and says, Mummy, you must convert. They won't leave you alone until you convert, so my advice is to you is to convert. Convert to being a Christian. Because as soon as you've converted to being a Christian, they leave you alone. <laughs> and as soon as they walked out the ward, then you can convert back again to being a Buddhist. <laughs> you can convert one way, you can convert the other way. You know, fair, fair. But it gets them out for a while, and then you can actually die peacefully. <laughs> Because that's the main point of being, not harassing a person. Because look, you can't convert at the very end. Who you've been for your whole life is who you are when you die. You just can't change. The conditioning is so strong. So if you've now been a really scallywag, you've never been to the temple, you've never actually kept still the precepts, you've never given donations, you've never meditated, don't think, okay, well, I'm going to die now, I better start going to the temple today. <laughs> it's like, it's like you haven't done any work at school and then the last minute, you know, you just, uh, you know, get your books out and study just the night before the exam. You can't do it that way. People try that, you know, this a Malaysian woman, she came up to me, it was the, um, the university exams. She's first year at university, she managed her parents, rich parents, and sent her to Perth to study. Tomorrow was the exams, and so she asked me, personally, to do some chanting for her, to give her good luck for the exams. So I did the chanting for her, and I chant for anything. I bless anything, bless a car, bless a baby, or bless your handbag if you want. <laughs> so lots of money comes into it. <laughs> so I was blessing the... Um, <laughs> this woman, this young lady, to do her exam, and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you, she left. I never saw her again, but I saw her friends. And her friends were, came out to me and said, you know that lady who came to uh, ask for a blessing? She's going around bagging you, Ajahn Brahm. She's saying, Ajahn Brahm is a no-good monk, he's hopeless, he's terrible, he doesn't know how to chant properly. <laughs> <laughs> because she failed. <laughs> and she blamed me. And her friend said, Ajahn Bhav, you don't need to feel guilty about that because this girl had never been to lectures, never done her assignments, first year away from home, you know, from Malaysia where her parents were looking after her, making sure she didn't get up to any mischief. First year away, she was going to nightclubs, parties, enjoying herself, not doing any work. You know, the academic part of her time in Perth, she wanted me to look after <laughs> so that she could go to more parties. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So all the chanting in the world won't help you at the last minute if you haven't been a good person. All the donations in the world, if you've been a bad person you're going to die tomorrow, you know, you don't say, oh my goodness, well you know, I'd better give a donation because my, my, my wife is going to spend it or my kids will spend it. So you take out all your bank account and give it to the Buddhist Society the day before. It's too late. <laughs> it won't work. So you can't actually do that. You have to do your whole life is what will create your final thoughts. And I, don't, I know that, I'm not sure if you've had these experiences. I used to read about them in books, about you know, your last dying moments, your life flashes before your eyes. You know, I've had that when I was only about 19, not much of a life to flash be before my eyes, but it actually happened. You know, during my vacations I love going to um, Scotland. I mentioned another story about Scotland earlier today, about being lost in the mist. Well, on this particular occasion, I you know, lost a path you know, on the cliffs by the ocean and you know, I slipped and I did fall down a cliff. I had a very heavy backpack on and so the backpack actually twisted me around 
And so I saw this vertical cliff in front of my eyes. And it went down, 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 and still I couldn't feel the bottom. Down, 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 down. And I thought I was going to die, just by myself. And that was where, amazingly, and I can remember this, is major events of my short life just came up in front of me. And, you know, not many, but just maybe it felt like about three or four minutes. <coughs> and then I could feel solid earth. I couldn't see where I was going, I was just facing this cliff. Feel solid earth under my, my uh, feet. And I bent my legs, rolled, and stood up. I wasn't injured at all. I think one toenail had come off, that's all. You know, it hurt, but it wasn't, no damage, no blood, you know, no broken bones. And I looked up at the cliff, and it was only about six foot high, the cliff. <laughs> 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 and I just couldn't believe it. You know, this is impossible. But there you were. Because weird things happen just when you think you're going to die. You know, time gets distorted, and even distance gets distorted. But the main point was, I thought I was going to die, and I had all these images come up in my mind, you know, of my major events. So it was a great sort of little experience for me to know, actually, this is what happens. You, and it's involuntary, you can't choose what you remember. So your last thoughts will be those memories, the major events of your life. So what do you remember? Because some people ask, how can we have good thoughts so we get a good life? It's because we do good things. And the major events of your life, the things which you know, really move you and create a huge impression on you. And you know, some of those moments of my life, the ones which really mean a lot to me, you know, is you know, when you, know, you do get sort of letters from somebody, you really help them. You know, like you know, sometimes people come up, without you Ajahn Brahm, I'd be dead. And I mean that. Like this woman who came up, you know the book you got out there, Opening the Door of Your Heart? Uh, after the first edition, they wanted to do a second edition. And they wanted a new forward, and I wrote this forward in that book. And this, is, this will be one of those things I remember just when I die. This woman came to my monastery in Perth. She was from, I think, Switzerland, from Bern, that's right, it's Bern in Switzerland. And as soon as she saw me, she got very excited. And she got out a dog-eared copy of Opening the Door of Your Heart. And she said, I've flown all the way from Switzerland to Perth, and from Perth to this monastery, just to see you. After I've seen you, I'm going to go back to Bern again. I'm not travelling around, nothing else, i just come here to see you. Because this book has saved my life. She said, she had uh, cancer together with uh, paranoia, anxiety disorder, emotionally and physically, you know, doctors had given up on her. Some friend had said, read this book, and it had changed her life so much, anxiety disorder, depression, <coughs> vanished, the cancer went into remission, and she blames me for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so she came, and she said, I just have to see you, and would you sign my book for me? And I said, of course. And as soon as I said yes and got hold of the book and started signing it, she cried and cried and cried and cried with joy. Thank you so much. And then she took the book, and she left, and I'd never seen her again. She went back to Switzerland. Now those, where you've actually done something, you've really helped, you've given, that is what stays in your heart. Those are the sorts of things which you will remember when you die. Those are the things which will take you to a really beautiful rebirth, if you're going to have a birth at all. Just those great deeds you have done for other people, you know, for the BSV. I don't mean the ordinary donation today. Right, this is it. 50,000 <laughs> for new birth. You just do it. Our nuns' monastery. Uh, some of these inspiring, this is another inspiring moment. I'm not really responsible for this. But n the monastery for the bhikkhunis over in Perth, in the Dhammasara. Yeah, you had the idea. Let's do it. You wrote an a article in, in, the, in the magazine. Get people interested. And you know what happens when you're fundraising. Five dollars, ten dollars, 
You do a, a cake store, a hundred dollars, that's not enough to build a monastery. And then, but we started. And then one day this, this man arrived just in an ordinary car. He wanted to see me. He was wearing jeans and a, a singlet. You know, like a, more like a builder's labourer than anything else. And he came up to me and he said, I hear you are building a monastery for women, a Buddhist monastery. He said, I'm a Buddhist. And he said, my wife yesterday gave birth to my first child. It's a daughter. And to celebrate the birth of my first child, a daughter, I want to help with building this nun's monastery. And he said, I doubt if my daughter will ever want to become a Buddhist nun, but I want her to have the chance. I want her to have the choice to do that. So I want to support your project. And he handed over a check for $250,000. Biggest check I've ever seen. And I'm usually a very calm monk, but as he handed it over, <laughs> I, I was shaking. <laughs> That's, that's inspiring. And those inspiring, beautiful moments of life, those are the ones you remember when you did something extraordinary. And if you've done something extraordinarily bad, you better sort of you know, heal that up pretty quickly because sometimes they come up, <laughs> you know, your last <laughs> moment. Bad things you said to somebody. So if you have done something bad, get forgiveness as soon as you possibly can. If you're not forgiveness for them, even if they're dead. You know, it's amazing the forgiveness things. You know, when my father died, you know, I had this terrible guilt. One of the things I had guilt for, stupid. But you know, when it's your own guilt, you know, you amplify it out of all proportion, you obsess about it. And my guilt, <laughs> you may laugh about this, was as a 15, 16 year old kid, my favourite music was Jimi Hendrix, it was very loud. And my father's favourite music was Frank Sinatra. And when he put on his Sinatra records, because you know, I was you know, a kid who was always competing against the senior male role model in the, my family, my father. If he put on his Sinatra record, I'll put on my Jimi Hendrix record to compete. And Jimi Hendrix is much louder than Frank Sinatra, I'd always drown him out. And that's a stupid thing a kid would do. But I did that. And when he died, that's a stupid thing. I remember that. I said, oh, what did I do that for to my dad? I wish I hadn't done that. The problem was he was dead. And I couldn't say sorry. And that hurt even more. Until later on, I realised it doesn't matter if they're not here, if they're dead, or if they're on the other side of the world. And I just went up to a Buddha statue. I bowed, and I said, no, Father, Dad, even if you may not be able to hear me, I'm going to do a forgiveness ceremony. I did that forgiveness ceremony. Dad, you know, for all those times I paid my Jimi Hendrix <laughs> to drown, <laughs> to drown <laughs> out, you know, ignore Frank Sinatra, I'm sorry. I was just a stupid young man. And I, and I imagine what he would say. And of course, you know, my father said, what are you talking about? I knew what was going on. I was a kid myself once. I know what it feels like. That's nothing at all. I still love you. You're totally forgiven. When I imagined that, the problem was over. You freed yourself from that guilt. And I say that to you now, that if you have got unfinished business, please ask forgiveness before the person dies. It's much easier. Even if they don't accept it, that's not important. You, you ask for it. Say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful moments to be able to do that. And so once you ask that forgiveness, it's a great weight you know, off your heart. So when you do die, you're more likely to be able to, to remember the good things which happened. And then when actually that death process actually happens, you know, if you haven't got memory of your past life so you can remember what it's like, just <coughs> through the deep meditation, you can understand exactly what happens when a person dies. Because I often say, when you get into the deep meditations, especially these jhanas, it's like learning how to die, because when you get into deep meditation, as I was saying this afternoon, you see these beautiful lights, what we call the nimittas. And every one of you will one day see that nimitta. <laughs> if not when you're meditating, 
<laughs> when you die. Haven't you ever heard people seeing the light and floating towards the light? That light which you see at death is precisely the same which you see when you're meditating. Because what you see when you're meditating, your five senses turn off. You just subdue them just through tranquility. But in death, they just turn off <coughs> because of the death process. And that light is actually a reflection of your mind. And I never said this to the meditators, but when that nimitta first comes up, I wrote about this in my book, when that nimitta, that light first comes up in meditation, sometimes it can may, not, may not be that brilliant. Sometimes it can be like dirty and dull. And I know exactly what's happening there. If it's dirty and dull, it means you haven't been keeping a precept. You know, your mind is not that pure, because that light which you see is a reflection of your mind. That's why for those of you who know the Pali, Pabhasara Jitta, this mind is radiant, beautiful, when there's no defilements coming into it, when it's pure. But if it isn't pure, your light which you see at the end of death won't be that bright, brilliant. But I'll tell you a meditation trick. Remember this when you die. It's like a loophole. <laughs> when you see sort of that light after you die, yeah, parts of it may not be so beautiful, but the other parts <coughs> are. Only a little part is stained and dirty and grubby, but another part is the most beautiful. So you always learn how to look at the most beautiful part of that light. And that's what you do with meditation as well. You've got, your mind goes towards, not the faults, but the beautiful part. And the beautiful, you zoom in on the beautiful part, and that some parts is not that clean, some parts are a bit dirty. You zoom in on the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part. And that's how you get this beautiful, brilliant nimittas. You're focusing on your goodness instead of fault-finding on your bad parts. And that is where, you know, if you've lived a life of fault-finding, always criticizing other people, always saying, Buddha society of Victoria, not good enough. Husband, not good enough. Government, not good enough. The carpet, not good enough. It's amazing how critical some people can be. They're always finding fault, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing. If you develop that negative, critical type of mind, when you die, you will actually see the dirty part of Nimittus. You're inclined towards that. That's been your whole nature, seeing the faults in things. That leads to a bad rebirth. So for goodness sake, look at the beautiful part of life. Don't look at the two bad bricks in the wall. Look at the beautiful bricks in the wall. See a person's good qualities. Yes, they may be not the best, but you know, they're trying. You can see their good qualities. Seeing other people's good qualities encourages those good qualities to grow more and more and more and more. And do that with yourself. Yeah, you may not be perfect, but there's many good things you've done. Focus on the good things we've done in life. Focus on the kindness, the good you've done. I was talking with one man, he's so depressed and negative. I did the exercise of the piece of paper. Draw a line down the center. The left bit of the paper, write all the things which are wrong with you. All of your faults, all your weaknesses. And he did that with glee. He finished the left half of the paper really quickly. In fact, it wasn't big enough, he wrote in the margins. <laughs> and they said, great, you filled in the left half of that piece of paper. Now on the right-hand side of the piece of paper, write something good about yourself. And he just stood there and he couldn't write anything. He said, there's nothing to write about. There must be something. He said, no, there's not. He said, and I, I said, have you got a cat? He said, yeah, I've got a cat. Did you feed the cat this morning? Yeah. Put that down. <laughs> Fed the cat. <laughs> That's true, that's how I did this. He said, fed the cat. So what else have you done? Really good today. Oh, I just said good morning to some of my neighbour. Put that down. Because once I got the first one down, the second one came much easier. And then the third one, and then he filled up the whole right-hand side of the piece of paper. And he was surprised that he could do that. Because your mind is so blocked in negativity, you just cannot see anything good in yourself. You get someone like me to force you to see something good, you fed the cat. And then that turns the mind to seeing the positive, and then you can still 
very easily fill in the right-hand side of the piece of paper. And so then I told him to get the scissors, cut it up in half. The left-hand side of the piece of paper, that goes in the trash can. The right-hand side with all the beautiful things you've done, starting with feeding the cat, that gets photocopied and laminated. <laughs> and you keep it around everywhere, your toilet, your bedroom, your office, everywhere, to remind you to see the beautiful side of yourself. And that took him out of depression. He realised actually he was quite good. So if you can stop the negative part of your life and get to the positive side of your life, then limiters will be beautiful, you will get good memories when you die and that will take you off into a beautiful world. And don't be so paranoid, you don't have one last thought. Any doctor here knows, I've been with people dying, dying is a process, takes many minutes, actually many minutes usually, a couple of minutes. So people start the dying process and then two or three minutes later, you may correct me on if it's longer, but it's not a second, it takes time. At the end of that process, then you're confirmed dead. And doctor, when they have to say the time of death, they know they can't give it to the minute. It's roughly about, you know, somewhere between five past two and ten past two or something. So they put six minutes past two or something, just for the piece of paper. But they mean it's actually a whole process which happens. So you have many thoughts. So just one random bad thought. You know, I hate Ajahn Brown. I shouldn't have said, oh my goodness, I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> That doesn't matter at all, it's just a general flow of your mind over those last few minutes. And because that is the force, the positive energy which will drive you into a good rebirth, where you seek to be reborn. And as the Buddha said, there's two, in brief, there's two main causes for your rebirth into a next life. And one of them is your karma, obviously, and the other one is your want, your desire, where you want to be reborn. It's just like if you want to go, say, to London. There is two causes to get to London. The first is the wherewithal. You've got the money, you've got the visa, you've got the air ticket. That's like the karma. And the second is you want to go there. Even if somebody buys you a ticket but you don't want to go. You can go but you don't want to. Of course you won't get there. So a lot of people have got enough good karma to get a good rebirth, but they just don't want to. Like one of my stupid disciples in Perth, when I asked him, where do you want to get reborn? He said, I want to get reborn as a dog. <laughs> he said that. Are you crazy? Why do you want to get reborn as a dog for? And quite logically he said, well, dogs don't have to go to work on a Monday morning. <laughs> they don't have any stress. They, and dogs can sleep as much as they like and they get fed delicious food. Even our caretaker in Perth, the cat there, will only eat Angus beef. <laughs> <laughs> and the owner gives it to, to the cat. You know, no chicken, nothing out of a can. The best Angus beef. That's the only thing the cat <laughs> will eat. So animals, they get pampered these days. And so, he said, that's what I want to be, I want to be pampered for once. You know, eat really well, just, you know, all I need to do is go for a walk in the morning and just, you know, my job is just to be patted and scratched and for that I get to eat well, sleep in a nice warm place and just have nothing to do all day. So that's what I want to be, I want to be a dog in my next life. And that's actually when I reminded him, in Australia, after you've been uh, born as a puppy for a few weeks, you have to get sent to the vet to get de-sexed. <laughs> and as soon as I said that, he said, I don't want to be a dog. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think it through. <laughs> but if you want to be a dog, and you've got enough car, it doesn't take much of an airfare to get reborn as a dog, then that's where you will end up. So be careful where you want to go because you might end up there. And I don't know if any of you have read uh, Plato's Republic. In the last chapter of that, they have Plato's idea of like the rebirth. The ancient Greeks all believed in reincarnation. And uh, he said that when a person dies, they go over the river Styx with a ferryman. You can actually see that in movies these days, the ferryman taking you over the river Styx. Where you go to the Elysian fields, a place where you can rest and have a bit of fun and relax. But the interesting thing I'll always remember 
about Plato's description of rebirth. He said, people have a choice where they want to be reborn and who they want to be reborn as. You've got a choice. And Plato said, the stupid people, the crazy ones, are the ones who choose to be reborn and become famous or really wealthy or really poor. He said, the smart ones, the wise ones who've been around, they're the ones who are comfortable but not rich, well respected but not famous, the ones who just pass under the radar of everybody, can live a nice, peaceful, happy life. The middle way people, they are the best. And it's true, anyone who wants to be famous is crazy. I know because I'm getting too famous, and <laughs> even today, Four o'clock I was supposed to finish and I wanted to go to the toilet. I've been sitting here since 1pm. I'm a human being, I've got a bladder as well. And you might think I'm a Buddha statue. The Buddha statue doesn't need to go to the toilet, given, but I do. And I was sitting here at four o'clock and all these people coming up, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And in the end I had to tell, I don't know if she's here, I'm sorry, but I said, look, I, I can't answer your question. I really do have to go. So I did go at five o'clock. <laughs> so it's terrible. And this has happened so many times. Once I was in Hong Kong and giving a talk in the jockey club there. And afterwards, a couple of hours talk with questions and answers. Any more questions? No. And then as soon as we you know, did the sharing of merits or something, the whole line of people asking their questions. <laughs> so they, did, they wanted to ask their questions in, pr in private instead of in public. Fair enough. And so another hour and a half answering questions, photographs. And I got up and walked out and stopped every five minutes, another question, another photograph, another signing of a book. Until I got out to the foyer and lots of people waiting for me there, signing books. <laughs> Eventually, after another hour, I got into the toilet. <laughs> oh, so relieved to get into the toilet. <laughs> But you know the male toilets and female toilets, you go through the door and there's the washrooms first of all and then the cubicles just a bit further on. And as I was walking past the wash tubs, a man turned around and said, Alright Jim Brum, can I ask you a question on meditation? <laughs> Even in the toilet I can't escape. <laughs> Unfair! <laughs> That's why I always go in the cubicle. Because if I'm doing it to stand up, urinal, there'll always be somebody come up to me. I was wearing urinal. I can't go. Can I? I don't get any peace. <laughs> it's true, Priya. It's absolutely true. I don't make this one up. So I'd never ever be famous and never ever be really, really wealthy. I remember going to this woman's house once, very, very wealthy, a big mansion in Perth, next to the river, and to do a blessing. And when I do these blessings, and I just sprinkle holy water in all the rooms. And there were so many rooms. <laughs> Never seen so many rooms. It took forever to do the blessing. And also, this was some years ago, because actually, when I first arrived, I needed to go to the toilet and say, which way to the toilet? And this again is no exaggeration. Which way to the toilet? She had to draw a map <laughs> in her own house. Because these days, mansions, they always come with their own GPS. <laughs> you need a GPS to find your way around, they're so big. But anyway, the, you know, after just the blessing, you know, I was talking to her, I said, how many people live in the house? She said, just me. <laughs> and at that, my heart sank. There's so much compassion for this woman. I said, why don't you have any friends or relations staying here? She said, because I'm so terrified of them. They'll ask for a loan, I'll ask for some money. So all my relations, you know, I'm afraid of them. They're people who are trying to take my money away. Any visitors, you know, I try and keep them away because they're going to ask for something. Her wealth was a disease. She was so afraid of losing it that she would never allow any friends into her life, cut off all her relations. A prisoner in her own wealthy mansion. That's so sad, and I've seen many people like that. You know, they have, they have um, iron bars and CCTV cameras and guards on the gate of their mansion 
just like a prison. What's the difference between a mansion and a prison? On the outside, high walls, CCTV cameras, looks pretty much the same. So, don't get reborn as a wealthy person. Middle way is the best. <coughs> so anyway, you have a choice there, and so off you go and get reborn. But there's other end-of-life issues, and one of them which you know, I wanted to talk about, I've just gone off track a bit, is ghosts. Because sometimes people don't get reborn that quickly. Sometimes they stay around as <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> so now, someone at the back there, can you please dim the lights? <laughs> <laughs> because, that, thank you so much. Yes, dim the lights. Because it's amazing, just people think there's no ghosts, but there's plenty of ghosts around. That's more like it. Ooh. Okay, it's not spooky enough. I'll, I'll see the video. You don't need to, as long as the video is a bit hazy and you just see, see white shapes floating across the screen, that's good enough. Because, you know, I love ghosts because they're really interesting, they really do exist. And, of course, one of the places where you probably see the most ghosts are in funeral parlours. And on one funeral which I was doing in Perth a year or two ago, and if you go to funerals, actually, you know, you... It's <laughs> the light off. There's a bad, it'll turn off itself when the ghost wants to. <laughs> <laughs> In the funerals, you, know, you start at usually the gate, you go in procession to the grave site. I think that happens for in Victoria as well. And the grave site was a long way from where we started walking. And I was standing next to the funeral director and we were talking. And it's a long way and so I asked the funeral director, how long have you been in this business? He said, oh, I'm about 30 years, I'm about to retire. I said, oh great, have you seen any ghosts? The funeral director, they should be the person who's experts on ghosts, you know, having dead bodies in their office every day. And she said, oh yeah, many, many, many. You, you know, she's in her office doing work and they just walk past. And I know they're supposed to be in their coffin, so get back in your box. <laughs> <laughs> and she was serious. I said, what's the most scariest one? The scariest ghost story? This is from a funeral director. And she thought, okay, this happened only a few days ago. Because in a funeral, in the hearse, where you put the box, you may not know this, but that hearse is cleaned after every funeral. So they may do three or four funerals a day. But once they return from the, the cemetery, they employ one man to actually clean that hearse inside and out for the next funeral. So it's cleaned many times a day. They employ someone just for that job. And the fellow, the hearse had just come back from one funeral, was going in an hour for the next funeral, so he was cleaning it inside first of all, making it spotless. And once it was spotless inside, he locked it up, and then he noticed the windows starting to mist up. All the windows inside the hearse became misty. And then, that was you no know, spooky, but what happened next was even worse. Handprints started to appear on the mist. Handprints came from nowhere. On the inside, misted up, but on the outside wasn't misted, it misted up inside. Handprints started to appear. Something inside was trying to get out. Spooky. He 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 he. But one, one of the spookiest ghost stories I heard was this. As I, I, hopefully you can't remember this from the last time I told it here. I'm sure I told it here before. But this guy, he went to. I won't say which city it was in. He went to the Buddhist temple one evening. And it wasn't that far from his house, so once the talk was over, he walked home. And as he was walking home, 
You know, he had a choice. He can go the long way round, he could take the shortcut through the cemetery. <laughs> now, a lot of people, you know, would rather go the long way round, because at night time, this time of night, walking through the cemetery, you know, you have to be pretty brave to do that. But he, you know, he wasn't really that afraid, and he wanted to get home as quick as possible, so he took the shortcut, which was a big mistake. And as he was walking through the cemetery, and it's very dark, well he had some lights, but you know, not as light as the ordinary streets. And as he got halfway through the cemetery, nothing had happened. So he was thought, over halfway, should be okay now. But just over halfway, you know what it's like sometimes? You have this feeling that something is following you? Yeah, he thought something was following him. And he thought, just imagination, but nevertheless, when you feel that something is following you, you always tend to walk a little bit faster. <laughs> so he walked a bit faster, and he was sure whatever was following him also started to increase its pace. <laughs> so he started to, you know, not to run yet, but just walk really fast. And whatever was following him was also moving fast, because he could hear it. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> and as he came, to the end of the cemetery, he made the biggest mistake of his life. He looked around. And what he saw almost gave him a heart attack. <laughs> right behind him, coming towards him, was a vertical coffin. A coffin. And it had the earth falling off it, cobwebs all over it. Bump, bump, bump coming towards him. He freaked out. And he started running. His house was not that far away. He ran as fast as he could. But it doesn't matter how fast he ran, bump, 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 <laughs> the coffin came in after him. Bump, bump, bump. He got to the gate of his house. You know the front, the garden gate? He didn't open it. He jumped over it because the coffin was catching up. And as he got to the front door of his house, the coffin was at the gate. You could see it there. It was catching up really fast. Bump, bump, bump. And as he got out his keys, bump! The coffin broke down the gate, the garden gate. And that's when he dropped his keys. <laughs> <laughs> Bump, bump, bump! As the coffin came towards him, he picked up the first key he could, just hoping for the best, shoved it in the, the lock. He was lucky, it was the right key. Turned the lock, jumped inside, slammed the door just as the coffin came to the front door. He could see it through the glass of the, the window. He was only a couple of inches between the coffin and him, but he had the front door. He was safe, he was inside the house. He was sweating, panting, his heart was racing, but he was inside, he was safe. BUMP! <laughs> <laughs> really hard against the door! BUMP! <laughs> As the hinges started to give way, the coffin was breaking down the door. So, <laughs> he did what you would do, he would ran up the stairs to the only room with a lock, the bathroom. As he got to the top of the stairs, BUMP! And the door gave in. He could see the coffin come into his own house. Bump, 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 up the stairs came the coffin. He ran into the bathroom, locked the door, hoping for the best, panting, scared. <coughs> BUMP! <laughs> as the coffin started to break down the bathroom door. <coughs> he knew he was in big trouble. That coffin was so supernaturally strong, it could break down the front door of a house. How much more the bathroom? BUMP! <laughs> <laughs> as the bathroom door started to give way, he went against the back wall of the bathroom. BUMP! As the door gave way, and there he was, the coffin 
he was against the wall and the coffin, nowhere to run, nothing between him and the coffin now. And so he took the first thing he could, just a bottle of medicine from the shelf in the bathroom, and he threw it at the coffin. And it broke. And all this brown liquid went over the coffin, and it stopped. That coffin never moved again. You know why? Because he looked at the bottle, it was actually cough medicine. <laughs> it stops the coffin! <laughs> <laughs> cough medicine <laughs> stops the coffee. <laughs> Where was the last time I told that here? A couple of years ago. <laughs> okay, we have the lights on again now. But real ghosts, they don't chase you. They're very good. They're very nice stories. One of the stories which I haven't told about ghosts, because even dogs can be ghosts. And there was a lady in Perth, she had a nice dog. She lived by herself, go for a walk every morning, evening with the dog. And she said one day, a few days before the dog died, she was playing with the dog in the forest. When she got home, she found she'd lost her finger ring in the forest. So she went back with the dog to look for it. And I spent a couple of hours looking for a finger ring. But it's in a forest with so many leaves and twigs. She knew roughly where she lost it but she couldn't find it, so she gave it up for lost. She said, it wasn't expensive, but it had emotional value for her. So, she gave it up, and a couple of days later, the dog died. She forgot all about her fingering, because she really grieved the death of her dog. And anyway, a few days later, after the dog died, she swore to me she heard the dog bark in her house. Now, you know the sound of your own dog's bark, and it's not other people's dogs, you recognise it, because you've lived with it for such a long time. And she recognised the dog's bark, and she always wanted to see it one last time. But it was never in the room where she was in, it was maybe another room, she ran to that room, opened the door, nothing to be seen. It was so frustrated, she could hear it but not see it. And then one day, she was just outside <coughs> the front door of her house, and she heard the dog outside barking. Her dog. She opened the door really quickly, there was no dog there. But in the middle, smack bang in the middle of her welcome mat, was her finger ring. Hadn't been there, she'd been in and out of that house many times. No one else had been in there. The finger ring had been found by the ghost dog. And that's the last time she heard her dog. Ghosts are good like that. They can find things for you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that sort of ghost, I've gone on a bit too long now. So, that is something about death and dying, you know, with making it not so serious with a nice little joke. And that true story about the hands coming on the inside of the, uh, the, the, uh, the hearse. So you don't know if, you know, if you travel in a hearse with your <laughs> uncle or auntie who's just passed away, you never know who else is in that hearse, so be careful when you drive to the cemetery in the hearse. Much better to go in your own car. <laughs> okay. So, we have some questions and answers before we finish off. We've got a couple of questions here. Are they about the subject? Okay, okay, this is um, to do with death and dying. What is the Buddhist view on abortion of unwanted babies and late termination of babies who have congenital abnormalities? And what is the Buddhist view on euthanasia? Should it be legalized? Okay, the first thing about abortions, I forget what the law is now, but up to, is it 12 weeks? Is that correct? 12. Uh, one can have legally an abortion, but sometimes you say, why is abortion legal but voluntary euthanasia isn't? Why is one form of killing legal, another form of killing is not? And if anything, voluntary euthanasia, where a person chooses to, 
is less morally wrong than when a little baby in the womb uh, is euthanized just because the parents. But anyway, uh, in Buddhism, this is from the Theravada Vinaya, they have to find out when does life begin? When in the womb is it counted to be a human being? And it says there when consciousness first manifests in that being in your womb. From the point, time when consciousness first manifests, that is the time it's counted to be a human being. And that's how the Buddha says. And when does consciousness first manifest in the womb? That will be when there's enough neural connections you know, between the ears so that you manifest Vedana, pleasure and pain. When that fetus actually does show signs of responding to pleasure and pain. And from that time on, it's going to be a human being. Before that time, it's not considered in Buddhism to be abortion. And, I don't know, what is that time when it starts to develop, you know, its brain, so it can actually respond to pleasure or pain? I don't know the number of weeks, I always wanted to find out accurately. But before that time, it's not considered to be sort of killing a human being. And that is one of the reasons why that sometimes people show uh, videos you know, done with ultrasound of an abortion. And if you see that being squirm and manifesting like what we recognize as pain, that becomes quite hard to watch and we think that that becomes immoral. But if you actually don't see any sort of reaction you know, to that uh, process, you know, even we look at that and say, well, it's not really feeling it. It's not got the conscious uh, neural network to actually to experience that pain. Therefore, it doesn't really matter. And that's exactly how the Buddha said it. So, as a Buddhist, you have that time when an abortion is not killing. After that time, it can be. But even if after that time it is killing, that then again, you know, sometimes we have moral dilemmas. And the one which I like quoting, because I was visiting my mother in England once, she was watching the news, I was watching it with her, and there was this case where a woman was pregnant with twins, and her condition was such that if they didn't abort one of those twins, all three of them would die. And the doctors were unanimous, clear as you could possibly be, aborting one of those fetuses would save the other two, the mother and the twin. <coughs> and so it was a debate going on in the news. In this case, was abortion moral? And the doctor had the duty of care. The doctor had to make that decision. And before all of the ethicists could pronounce, mostly the religious nuts, they aborted one of the children so the other two could survive. If you were the doctor, a Buddhist doctor, it was your choice, you had that duty of care, you had to make the decision, you couldn't palm it off to somebody else. What would you do? Would you abort one child to save the other two? Or would you think, no, I'll do nothing, causing the other three to die? Most Buddhists would actually, I've asked this many times, put their hand up, most Buddhists realize that doing nothing is killing three. And so they would say, you know, I'm in this terrible situation, it's kill three or kill one. In that case, killing one. So they did, he did that abortion. And I would actually say in that case, that was a case where he did the right thing. Sometimes abortions, in the situation, if you talk to the person, it is the only thing you can do. And anyway, I make this point. Why is it all the people who legislate on this issue, all the people who talk about this, like Popes and Ajahn Brahms, who have, who have never had children, I've never been pregnant, neither has a Pope been pregnant. And why, what right have I to tell women what to do? And sometimes I look at that and I say, hang on, 
we don't understand what it's like for a woman to be pregnant and an unwanted pregnancy and all the incredible pressures on her. And so for me, I always think it's not my role to tell that woman what to do. And especially, it's not my right to make her feel guilty afterwards. My right, the only thing I can do, is to give support. And that's what I've done several times when a woman has come up and said, I'm considering an abortion, what should I do? I said, I can't tell you what to do, but what I can do is now ask you to please put aside fear. Don't make decisions out of fear. Because you know, I will be there before you, uh, before to give you as much support as you possibly can, and afterwards, whichever way you go, you know, I will still care for you. I will never criticize you because I know that how difficult a decision it is, and no one, no one has the right, no one has the information, no one can know what the right decision is. Only you, so you'll be beyond criticism. So. Because of that, and I do think that people, women should have the right and should not be afraid of punishment by law or uh, scolding by religious nuts who are mostly male who have never been pregnant. Give you the right. It's the toughest decision you'll ever make. And too often, because you make that decision, I'm sure there's many, maybe about 20-30% of you, if not more, have had abortions in this room. Women, it's the toughest decision you ever made. And the last thing you need is to feel guilty about it. That you should never do. You made a decision, right or wrong, guilt is not really part of it. You learn from it, try and make sure you don't put yourself in a position of an unwanted pregnancy again. But what I really don't like with abortion is men shoving heaps of guilt onto women. We've been doing that for far too long. We don't understand the pressures you have to go through. Toughest decision of your life. Men's role and other women's role is to support you and understand. Tough decision, whichever way you go, you'll still be loved and respected. And when it comes to Buddhist view on euthanasia, should it be legalized? Two types of euthanasia. There's Euthanasia, where somebody else kills you, the doctor puts you out of whose misery? Sometimes you put yourself out of your own, out of... I, put, I see a, an animal on the road, I put it out of my misery, because I don't like to see it suffering. And that's sometimes doctors and nurses give you the extra <coughs> dose of mer morphine because it's causing suffering to the doctor or the nurse. You're putting that patient not out of their misery, you're putting it out of your own misery. Because you don't like to see them suffer. It's your pain you're, you're looking at, not theirs. So I never think that euthanasia where somebody else does the deed is correct. But voluntary euthanasia is another ball game. That's where you decide how you die. Voluntary euthanasia where you take charge of your dying process. And as such, you all should know that the first person to do legally assisted voluntary euthanasia in the world, Mr. Dent, was a Buddhist from Northern Territory, from Darwin. And I know the reason why he did it. I never met him, but another of my monks did. They saw him in Perth Hospital when he came for treatment. He said he was considering voluntary euthanasia. What was his motivation? Why? And it was, he said, because his wife was giving him 24-7 care and would not take much respite. She thought that was her duty as his wife and his disease could go on forever. He had no quality of life and he said, I could endure that as a Buddhist but I've got compassion for my wife. I want to free her to give her a life where she doesn't have to always be looking after me. He said, I want to ask for voluntary euthanasia out of compassion for my wife. You may argue about that, but that was what he said. And that's why he did the voluntary euthanasia. And I've seen other cases, many of you, one of the cases which 
really turned me over to say voluntary euthanasia should be an option is when I went to see my mother in the Dementia Ward. My mother, she had a good mind, she was fine. But I also saw two women in that ward who were constantly in terror. The reason is their memory was so short they were waking up every minute or two in a strange place which they could not recognise with people around them they didn't know. Have you ever been travelling, you wake up in a hotel room, you don't know where the hell you are? And the people, you don't know who they are? You don't know what to do, you don't know even who you are? That is very frightening. And to have that 24-7 for the rest of your life, I, can, I don't know a fraction of their terror but I can understand it. And that is actually some dementia patients, constantly afraid, not knowing who's a friend and who's an enemy, where is safe, where is dangerous. And you can see just a terror in their faces. That is a suffering which will never be overridden by any palliative care drugs or any antipsychotics. Seen that, and for such people, you see that is really unacceptable. For such cases, you know, I would say that should be allowed. One for euthanasia. <coughs> Compassion, kindness, not the fear. And anyway, when it comes to precepts, anyway, what are the, the precepts in Buddhism? I always go back to core precepts coming from the Buddha's advice to Rahula. In the Rahula Awada Sutra, I quote this, this is sayings of the Buddha. He said, basically there's only two precepts. Never doing anything which harms or hurts another human being. Not doing anything which hurts yourself. And confining to a person to that suffering for so long is hurting them, is harming them. It doesn't seem right. But at the very least, I think they should have an option. Another moment in Australia, especially the people who are stopping the legalised euthanasia are getting religious nuts. You know, the people who are in our federal parliament, people like Kevin Andrews, who are just uh, are, are so dogmatic. They think they're doing the right thing, but 80% is the usual result in surveys, in, in, uh, in polls. 80% in Australia consistently you know, want it to be legalised with safeguards, as it is in other parts of the world. So personally, I can't tell people to do that, <coughs> that's against my precepts, but I say that you should have the choice. Anyway, that's what I say. You may disagree with me, but you know, I am a Buddhist leader and I know my Vinaya, I know sort of the ethics of Buddhism. I'm not some sort of person who just became a Buddhist yesterday. So, you know, I have got some, some uh, buns on the board, as they say in cricket, that, you know, this is almost an authoritative position. If 80% of Australian population feel it's really, really, really worthwhile, there must be some moral background to that. Anyway, uh, those are the two questions in the basket, euthanasia and abortion. All fun topics. <laughs> I remember when they were discussing euthanasia the first time in Parliament, and I forget who it was, but you know somebody said, sort of, uh, I don't agree with euthanasia, with the exception of members of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Making it a bit of fun. So maybe in the United States. No euthanasia except for people like Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> That's only a joke. Okay, any questions from the floor here? Oh, from upstairs? Are you still up there? <laughs> Bang on the floor? <laughs> yes, I heard it. Thank you. So, uh, the death and dying process. Yeah. Is that a ghost or on the floor? <laughs> okay. Hee <laughs> hee. So one of the other things I didn't mention just to uh, expand on death and dying 
is I focus mostly on the person who's doing the dying, a little bit about the family members. But the last bit about death and dying I never really mentioned was grief. And when I was a young monk, for nine years I was spending my time in northeast Thailand. And in northeast Thailand, it would be a small area of Southeast Asia which had never been colonized. And it was no exaggeration. I went to some villages in that area where I was the first white man they'd ever seen. I remember going on arms round as a monk. And when you were actually giving food on arms round in Thailand, same I think in uh, Sri Lanka in the old days, you would never look at the monk, you'd look at the bowl and put the rice in the bowl. But here, all the people on arms round, they were looking at me, they'd never seen a white man before, let alone a white monk. And so when they put the food in the bowl, it always fell on the outside, it never got in the bowl. The dogs loved me because they cleaned up that day. But because it had never been westernized, it was a pristine Buddhist culture. And one of the things I noticed there, which really was quite strange, I never saw grief in that area of Thailand. And the monastery where I was was a local cremation ground. So they used to have cremations every, at least every week, sometimes twice a week, where they get the wood from the forest and they put the person on top and they'd burn it. We could actually see it all. You know, hear the head explode, the pop, when the, the brain exploded and see everything happening. It's fascinating seeing cremations. You know one of the things about cremations, when the open cremations, when they put them in the casket, a very simple casket, they'd always put them on the side. And they'd actually jam pieces of wood in the side to make sure they didn't turn over. And a few times, you know, they made a mistake and they laid the corpse on the back in the, crema in the cremation, in the pyre. Because what happens, if you lay it on the back, it's just the way that you burn and the muscles contract and expand. And I always have my saw this, it's really cool. It's on the back, and because it burned, slowly the coffin would the corpse would sit up. <laughs> and sometimes, because of other muscles contracting and expanding, I saw this too. The coffin would sit up, the corpse would sit up, and the hand would come out. <laughs> I saw that. It was spooky. And it was nothing sort of supernatural, it's just the way the muscles, when they get burnt, one side, not the other side. Just how you come up and you actually point to people. <laughs> and that was so spooky, they made sure it's always on the side, so you know, if it did come out, we'd point to the side, never a person. <laughs> made them feel really guilty. But anyway, so they always put them on their backs. Well, always on the side, sorry, never on the backs. But uh, in that cremation ground, you saw the family, you were part of the village, and so you saw, the, you knew the people, you saw the person sick before they died, did the chanting for them, you know, you talked to the family members, you arranged the funeral, you saw them the next day, you went to their house for ceremonies, and I never ever saw anyone cry for nine years at a death. And there were young people sometimes, sometimes people loved their young, their wife died or their husband died, you know, in an accident or something, but never actually anybody who was, who actually was crying. And I talked to them afterwards. They never had grief in that society, which is amazing. What I learned there was grief is something we add on to loss. It's a cultural addition to loss. And one of the things which I saw was, remember, I think I was on retreat at the time when Princess Diana died, remember that time? But when I came out, everyone was sad. And what's happened? Haven't you heard? Princess Diana died, is that so? Well, is, is she your sister? Are you related to her? Are you a close friend? No, but it's still sad. It was a whole culture of grief, you know, came from this death. And people just really got into grief. And I thought, that doesn't help anybody. And I always knew there was another way of dealing with a loss. I'd always go back to my own father when he died. When he died, I never cried. And somehow or other, I've obviously been a Buddhist before, practicing Buddhist, because I don't know where I got this from. 
When he died, I was woken up in the middle of the night by my mother in the apartment. Can't wake your dad up. So I went into a room. I shook him as well. He was dead. He felt death with someone you're really close to. I was never shocked. It was just life. People die. He said, I was only 16 years of age at the time. Went to the crematorium. The only thing I was upset with at the crematorium, my father was an atheist. When I asked him about religion, he said, I was in the Second World War in Liverpool. I saw so much suffering, real pain. I can never believe in a God from that time on. That was his saying. He respected that. But of course, my poor old mum, not knowing what to do, just followed the funeral director and got this old Anglican priest to do the service for my dad. Uh, no, I mean, he was an atheist. Get out. <laughs> but nevertheless, the priest started saying, uh, Mr. William Betts, who was a very fine man, a good husband. And I felt at the time like standing up and saying, what are you talking You don't know my dad. <laughs> You've never met him. I said, this is just a farce. It's not true. And that hurt me more than anything else because I wanted a funeral to be real and truthful, not just made up to make people feel good. And, but anyway, I was a bit angry at that. And actually when I do funerals, I never say, you know, Prem was a very <laughs> wonderful Buddhist, if you weren't. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> but you know, you were, so you'll be safe. <laughs> because honesty, at the time of a death, that's one time you should be truthful, for goodness sake. So anyway, when my father died, you know, I didn't like that, but I never cried, I never felt sad, and that was weird. Walking out of the crematorium in Mortlake in West London, sort of not feeling sad. My father died, even though I loved him very much. And it took me years to understand my emotion. And I finally found out what I was feeling, because I could compare it to another emotion which was so common to me when I was young. It was a feeling I always used to get after going to a concert. Because I went to these great concerts when I was young in London. I saw the first, those of you who like rock music, okay, don't cry, you don't, you're not dead. So it should be okay. <laughs> Just being squashed, that's all. So, I went to the very first concert of Led Zeppelin in the Marquee Club. Saw them there. I went to see the Rolling Stones when I was only 11, snuck, snuck in, I shouldn't have got in, I wasn't old enough, <laughs> 11 years of age. I also, I went to this concert once in the north of London with my brother. Only four other people, only six people turned up to watch this, this uh, musician. And I thought as soon as they'd see us, only six people came, they'd just go home. What's the point of playing for six people? But they played. And the lead singer is called Rod Stewart. <laughs> 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 Private audience was Rod Stewart. <laughs> But I had all these great memories. I'm also going to um, classical music, uh, jazz and stuff, every type of music. In London, I love music. And after the performance, at the end of the performance, what would happen? We'd all stand up, clap and shout for more. The encore. But after the encore had finished, that was when I had to leave and the band had to pack up and go home. And you knew. You're not going to see Rod Stewart like that again. You know, the Rolling Stones, they changed their musical style. That concert was over and would not be repeated. And even though I walked out of the concert halls, knowing that the concert was over and I'd never hear it again, never once did I feel sad and cry after the end of a great concert. Instead, I always felt so privileged and so <coughs> lucky to have been present as some of the greatest performers by the greatest musicians of that time. How lucky I was to have been there at the time. And I knew I'd never forget that music. That's over almost 50 years ago now, no, 50 years, 45 years ago. And I still remember those concerts. They have stayed with me. And that was what it was like when I walked out of the crematorium. The great concert of my father's life had ended. It wouldn't come back again. But I never felt sad. I felt exactly like the end of a great concert. How lucky I was to have been there for 16 years with a man I love deeply. Thank you so much, Father. It wasn't a time for tears. It was a time for appreciation and gratitude. You don't need grief. There's another alternative. 
Don't look and focus on what's been taken away. Remember what you've had. And all those memories I had of my father, all of those little times when at 11 years of age he took me after and off work to play soccer with me. When I got in the school soccer team, he was supposed to be working on Saturday mornings when I was playing soccer for the school. And I saw him on the touchline watching me. And Arthur said, how come? You know, you're supposed to be at work today, Dad. How come you watch me? And he said, don't tell anybody, but I lied to my boss. I said I need a series of injections from my, from my doctor on a Saturday morning for the next <laughs> seven weeks. You know, he did lie, my father. His truthfulness wasn't the best. You know, that precept, you know, he broke every week. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I really, that really struck me. He was willing to lie and willing to, you know, to put his job on the line if he got caught out because he really wanted to see his son and support his son play soccer every Saturday morning. And all that, that just makes me teary, thinking of that. You know, that sacrifice of a father to their son. It was really important to a son. You know, to be so proud, you're playing soccer for the school team and there your father is cheering you on. Oh, that was just so wonderful. So that's how much I loved him. So that's why I never cried. <laughs> I felt so blessed and appreciative. So if you have a, a loved one who passes away, you don't have to cry. Don't look at what's been taken away, look at what, what you've had. You've been so lucky, so fortunate to have known that person. Thank you so much. And then at the death, you don't feel like crying. You feel like you're so lucky. The same feeling when you walk out of the great concert hall after an amazing performance. And yeah, even though the body's disappeared, you'll never be able to touch, kiss, hug him anymore. That's not the important part of life. The memories, the inspiration, those little things which you share together, like seeing on the touchline of the, uh, the football field when you're playing soccer. Those are the things which will never be taken away. Stay with you forever. They'll be there with me when I die. Some things never get taken away. Those are the important things, which means you don't have to cry. Grief is not necessary. It doesn't help you, doesn't help them, <coughs> doesn't help the world. Find an alternative and you will be inspirational for other people. Okay, that's a bit about grief. <coughs> yeah? I don't know, when the patient dies in the hospital and he's the Theravada body, Service. service, it really depends. There is no fixed service. People have asked me, Ajahn Brah, when you die, what is your, how do you want to be treated? <laughs> I wanted to give, was it that advanced something directive? Advanced, <coughs> advanced? advanced care planning. Advanced care planning, yes. My advanced directive, my instructions for my funeral, I do not want to be cremated, I do not want to be buried. All those two cost too much money. I want to be put in the recycling bin <laughs> and collected <laughs> by the verge by the local council. <laughs> I want to be recycled. That's the best thing to be. <laughs> Keep it simple, for goodness sake. And if I have a service, you know, maybe if I die in Perth, you know, you probably have a little ceremony, I imagine the BSP. I want you, as I said to people, to come up and tell your favourite jokes which you heard from me. Come up and say the coffin joke which I just said today. <laughs> so remember me with humour, not with tears. Isn't that a wonderful way? It's remembering, celebrating a life, not sort of mourning a death. Let me go, but remember all the beautiful examples of all the nice times we shared together. So that's what I would like, because that's my advanced directive. So if it's the Theravada Buddha, it depends what Theravada Buddha it is. Question from the kitchen. Okay, question from the kitchen. <laughs> okay, can we have a cup of tea from the stores? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. No, okay, so, so that's actually a Theravada Buddha, it really depends. Find out their traditions, Sri Lankan tradition, Theravada tradition, forest tradition, Burmese tradition, there are all sorts of different traditions. And it depends who the teacher is. Sometimes you can keep it simple, sometimes you can make it complicated. But you ask the family what they want.
Simple is always the best. So that's the best way. Yeah, are you, are the late young lady over there, you worrying about your own funeral? How are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're real, especially spirits. I said this before, but re please remember this, you probably haven't heard this before. The most dangerous one in the whole world, and I, sorry? Is it real? No, this is, this is a real, a real spirit. <laughs> and I've seen this, and I've seen this, and I've even seen this in Melbourne. And it's incredibly dangerous. It, I've seen it kill people, honestly. And I've seen it possess people as well. It makes them do things totally out of character. And even if they speak, and they can't even walk straight. And it's called the bottle ghost. <laughs> the bottle ghost, I think you remember the bottle ghost. The bottle ghost lives in bottles of whiskey, rum, gin, liquor. Because as soon as you open the top of a bottle of liquor, the bottle ghost goes inside of you and it makes you do all sorts of things which is totally out of character. You can't speak normal, you can't walk in a straight line, and if you drive a car you kill yourself. That's the most dangerous ghost in the world and that's why we call whiskey, rum and other such things spirits. <laughs> That is the ghost to be really afraid of. <laughs> yes. If you're afraid of death, it makes it happen much quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so the best thing, don't be afraid of death. Just enjoy your life. So when death comes, you've had a really, really good time. Done all the nice things in life. And you look back, just like on the end of a day, You've had a wonderful day today, come to the Buddhist temple in the evening, gone to school today, had met all your friends, had a wonderful time. What a great day this will be, but it has to come to an end. And when you die, you know, you come to rebirth again, another life, just like you go to sleep tonight, you wake up again tomorrow morning, have another day. That's just like, don't you be afraid of death. Death is only the start of another life. Okay, we've got a question here from the kitchen. Oh no, this is not possible. I, I made it up there when I said, can we have a cup of tea from the stores? Oops, where's it gone? Can we meet people we love who have died when we die? That's an interesting one. Yeah, you want to meet someone you love after you're dead, but do they want to meet you? He, he, he. And why do you want to meet them? <laughs> to get your own back afterwards? <laughs> so, and it's interesting, people say you do. But if you want to know the deep teaching there, that when you, well, maybe in another life you meet sort of old people you've met before, you know, you, you marry again, love at first sight, it's not on first sight, it's remembering someone you've married or being close to in a previous life. You do tend to get reborn in the same families and tend to meet each other. You know, so we go together as almost tribes or flocks. We get attracted to each other. So your know, wife in this life could have been your sister or your mother in a previous life. You, you've got a bond there which carries on from life to life. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can uh, meet a person in the next human life. But whether in the heavenly realms, or that place just after you die. You've got to be careful there because that we call a manomaya realm, a mind-made realm. And basically in that realm it's much more likely you create your loved ones. Your mind manufactures them and they're as real as can be. You see your mother just after you're dead. It's not your real mother, she's already been reborn somewhere. But to you it's like you meet her. You actually create that. Your mind is incredible what it can create, especially in that realm after death. It's a mind-made realm. These are beings you create, not the real one. 
but it certainly looks like her. But when you actually get reborn, you know, into maybe a human realm, then we tend to sort of associate together again. Anyway, this last question, this is from upstairs, the higher realms. NDE seem to contradict the Buddhist concept of rebirth. People account mention meeting dead relatives or friends. According to Buddhism, they would have taken rebirth. Exactly. This actually goes to what I've just said. I was really wondering, when people have NDEs, you know, some people say they meet Jesus on the other side. And then Jesus tells them, no, you've got to come back. Other people say they meet the Virgin Mary. And, and they're really clear they met them. Mahayana Buddhists say they met the Goddess of Mercy, Kuan Yin. Hindus met Lord Krishna. Atheists met Uncle George. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, these are real people and they're convincing. They said, yes, I saw Uncle George, I recognised him, it was him, I've known him for a long time, you know, before he died. It was him. And when I read those accounts of NDEs, I started to wonder, you know, is that real? You know, when a person dies, have you got this like room and uh, somebody emails Kuan Yin, Mahayana Buddhist, you know, your turn, come and meet them. <laughs> or someone, you know, so it's this guy coming up, he's an atheist, you know, who's around to meet them and greet them. Is that what's really going on? Or is it you meet who you expect to meet? You actually create those images. You create the Jesus which you expect. You create the Kuan Yin, which is just like the figure you see in your local temple. You are actually creating those images. They are not real, but my goodness, they, they look real. And you come back saying, you actually saw it. The power of perception, when freed from the body, is immense. That is actually what's happening. You may not believe me, but you die and you'll find out. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Um, so we get trained to start thinking as soon as someone has an arrest yeah. and not to stop until um, they're dead or... Uh, and you were saying also that it should be the person, the individual's choice whether they want to live or not. And yeah. So how do you think we should... Uh, this is, you know, again, uh, because of, modestly because of our fear of death, you know, that if, you know, your relation is under your, my relation is under your care and you let them die, I'm really upset at you and I can sue you. You didn't try hard enough to keep mother alive. And, you know, our whole attitude to death in places like the West is just so um, counterproductive, it's so weird. You know, we should realise that death is part of life and let it happen sometimes. Because what happens, you know, I said when you try CPR, and the person is dying, and they're going to die, and they do die, but they die very uncomfortably while you're trying your hardest you know, to keep them alive. And so, keeping people alive becomes much more important than caring. And the whole idea of being a doctor is really skewed. Unfortunately, that you are confined by the rules and regulations and the laws of the country in which you live. So I would love to change that. Especially if somebody does have these directives, look, I'm dying, leave me alone, it's my choice. Most important time of my life. Sometimes, practical ways of dealing with that. Because again, one doctor, he also came to see me once. And he was also really, really uh, uh, distraught. He was again on duty in the hospital, the registrar. He got, this is the days of the buzzers, he got a buzz, one of his patients was on cardiac arrest rushed to the bedside, performed CPR, managed to get his heart going again, but not before irreversible brain damage had happened. And so this poor patient of his was confined to a state of like being like a vegetable, as they say. But he was going to last, everything else in his body was fine. He was going to last like that for years, with no quality of life, because this doctor had stopped him dying, but not fast enough to keep him alive properly confined, half-half. He said, I feel so bad about that, what should I do next time? So I don't want to do that to anybody. He could feel the anger, the frustration of this man, whether he manufactured this anger or frustration or not, but he felt he really let this guy down, big time. 
What I actually told him to do is, you know, use you know, what everybody has, your intuitive powers. As you rush towards that person, just spend a, a second or a half second and just feel whether it's really worthwhile resuscitating or not. And a lot of time, that intuition, that subverbal or preverbal, you're not thinking about it, you're feeling it, will be accurate. And some say, no, it's not worth it, he's going. Trust that. Other times say, no, he's got a chance, give him that chance. So I told him that and he said, well, thank you for telling me that. I can't say to my superiors that's what I'm doing. But you know, that's what I'm going to do for now. Yeah. Okay. Can a female be born as a man in next life? A lot of people say it's very difficult, it's very important for me to know this as I feel my son is my own mother who died exactly three months before he was conceived. Of course it is. And I told someone that story, that um, my family, uh, you know, she got pregnant, a close disciple of monastery, saw them all through the pregnancy, you know, given them, they made done and make sure everything goes okay. Ultrasound five days before birth, but it was a stillbirth. And the five days since the ultrasound, everything was perfect, had actually twisted around and choked itself on the umbilical cord, you know, cut off the blood supply, so it was stillborn. I did a funeral for little Charlie, and I saw him there, and, but while I wasn't watching, the family took out a ballpoint pen and drew a line on the baby's heel, on Charlie's heel, a line there. Because the tradition was, if it's going to come back again, it will have that as a birthmark. And she was a very healthy woman, it was a tragedy that you know, almost got to the, the finishing line, but poor Charlie just tripped up at the very end, never got born. So, she got pregnant again, and they told me about this line, and I too was really interested to see if it had the birthmark. It did! This kid has got this birthmark on its head, exactly where they put it with a ballpoint pen. So, you know, it's obviously Charlie reborn, but was born as a girl, Annie. And Annie, you know, she behaved like a boy for the first few years of her life. Always playing with the boys, we beat up the girls, you know, <laughs> dressing up is really masculine. We all knew because it was a boy before. So yes, you can get reborn as a boy. Another interesting case, in one of our monasteries over in Thailand, uh, somebody found a, a monkey who was in a cage being really maltreated. So it was a forest monastery, so they, let the, they brought the monkey and released it from its cage in the monastery. Because, you know, it really couldn't look after itself, but, you know, a forest monastery was wide enough, could swing through the trees and the monks would look after it. And this monkey got so well associated with the other monks, when it became tea time every <coughs> afternoon, the monkey joined the other monks with a little cup of tea, holding <laughs> in his paws and drinking it with all the other monks. It was like one of the boys. <laughs> it was really cute. And was very protective of the monastery, so when a truck drove past making too much of a noise, it ran after it and got smashed by the truck, got killed. You know, just you know, a bit too sort of uh, not mindful enough. But anyway, what happened was the head monk there, he had good meditation and he told everybody what was happening. He shouldn't have done this, but he did. He said, he was in deep meditation, he could actually see the accident when he was meditating and he could see the monkey's stream of consciousness leave the body. And he followed the stream of consciousness and he went into the village, into the womb of a pregnant woman there. And you know, everybody knows everybody in the village, the monks know the villagers, the villagers know the monks, so you know exactly who it was. And he, entered the, and he told the monks that. And of course, everyone couldn't wait until this baby was born. <laughs> See what it looked like. Because you know, this is a really good monk, it doesn't lie. Everybody knew that was a monkey before, the monkey who lived in the monastery. And now it's born as a human being. And I never saw it, but the other monks said, <laughs> this is a, almost verbatim what they said, now the baby was a male, it looked like a human being, but was unusually hairy. <laughs> Had much more hair than a normal little baby. And everybody knew it was a monkey before. <laughs> <laughs> it probably was a monkey when it was young in the house as well. It was a wonderful case of a, a monkey seeing it being reborn as a human. Because it had been associating with the humans, with the monks, and made enough good karma by looking after the monks. So it got, you know, made that transition to being reborn as a human. So it's fascinating things. Yes? Um, I remember, um, you know how people do the ceremony to transfer men to 
Oh, yeah. Does that actually work, and how does that work? And how does that work? Okay. I uh, remember years ago seeing in the, the Melbourne Age that there was a vet who was, uh, well, this wonderful article. He was finished work on a Friday, he was going to country Victoria somewhere to a big house to have a weekend with his friends. So he's driving his car down one of the motorways and halfway along the motorway he got overcome with this incredible grief. They were really out of the blue and it was so strong he could not drive. He pulled over into the emergency lane wept and sobbed for about 15 minutes until, you know, it passed. And he came from nowhere and he didn't know what on earth was happening. How he, well, he suddenly got this huge emotion of, of sadness. And he was in the, by himself in the car. When he got to the country house, there was a message for him. His dog had been hit by a car. At precisely the moment he had this great attack of sadness, didn't know why. And there's a message there, your dog had been hit while you were driving. How many times as a mother felt something's really, really wrong with my son who's in New York and you find out, yeah, he's had an accident, fell down the stairs. There is a connection between people if you've loved them, lived with them, cared for them, even a dog, how much more so a son. I don't know if you've got children, sir, but if your son is on the other side of Melbourne and he gets beaten up by some crazy people, you would know that something's up, you'd feel it. That connection between people who are associated together, loved each other, that is the conduit which is used to transfer merits. It's as if you're doing something really beautiful and wonderful, inspiring, something maybe your, your dead grandma would be so proud, that's my grandson, he's in the temple, he's you know, listening to a Dharma talk, that's my grandson. She'd be so happy that you think of her and transfer the merits, you'll connect with her and she'll get that happiness. That's how it works. The same phenomena as when something bad happens, we feel it. When something good happens, we feel it too. That's how transference and merits works. And question here before we do that one. Dear Ajahn Bhav, you mentioned mind can be clear but brain is not functioning, sedated. Can you please explain the relationship between the mind and the brain? We did that earlier on. Sometimes the brain lives inside the mind. The mind's much bigger to it than the brain. But the mind usually just uses the brain when it's alive. It's one of the reasons why kids, when they're very young, can remember their past lives. Because their mind is really dominant, the brain hasn't really developed yet. But after about six or seven years of age, the brain actually dominates the mind. You can't have those memories anymore. Even some kids have imaginary friends up to that time because their mind is very strong. They can actually contact those beings when your brain takes over and it dominates you, you can't do that anymore. But when you die, the mind takes over again. There's one of the reasons, oh, there's this one BBC documentary. They had this guy in London and he had, suddenly he'd lost all his memory. You know, from a moment, and no one could understand why. He just got remarried only about six months before. He couldn't remember his new wife, didn't know her name, didn't know who she was and how he met her. Really weird. He could remember language, he could remember skills, but that type of his memory was just shot. And they didn't know why. And this, in this documentary, they hypnotized him on camera. And under hypnosis, you could remember, remember everything. And what had happened, he was working in a shed in the backyard. And these were the days before mobile phones. The phone rang in the house. He'd ran to answer the phone and hit his head on an open shutter. Just banged his head, a head trauma. And that was what had knocked out his memory. Under hypnosis he could remember everything. But when he took him out of hypnosis he couldn't remember anything at all. And it was a case of two types of memory. The memory in the mind, which is always there, and the memory in the brain, which can be, can be lost. Brain and the mind, two different things. And the mind can remember past lives. Brain can only remember this life, because it's only started in this life. Mind's been going a long time difference between the brain and the mind. Another question before we finish? Um, is it true like uh, if a good meditator dies, um, is it for, uh, after say 24 hours, it's possible to move the body past like, the hands and the legs? Does it still feel warm and flexible? Ah, be very careful because if a great meditator dies and they're still warm, they're not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
They're just meditating. <laughs> so that's really true. But sometimes that does happen. And I told, <laughs> I told one of the stories uh, earlier on about the, in the sutras about the, the monk meditating was cremated by the villagers. I've already said that. But a, even a, a more modern story, because you know, I've been around a long time, I met some great monks, and one of the most powerful monks I met was an Indonesian monk called, was it Sudamo? I think that's his name, I forget now. But anyway, you know, he's dead now, so I don't mind mentioning about him. But um, I met him first, it might be only about four or five years as a monk, in Wat Bawan, and as soon as I passed him, you could, that's a powerful monk, you could feel his power. And so I talked to him afterwards, what had happened to him. And he had been a layman in Indonesia, in Java, and he decided to go into the jungles to become a rishi, you know, like a hermit. And he went into the jungles when there were still jungles in Java, there's hardly any jungles now left. And deep in the jungles, sat under a tree and meditated. And how he described it, he was meditating and a star came right to him, standard limiter experience. And he said in his broken English, he sort of married the star, united with it, became one with it, a brilliant experience for a long time, a typical jhana experience. And then when he came out, you know, a long time had passed, he didn't know how long, but he noticed the jungle had changed. The jungle had been you know, a little bit ruined and broken twigs and stuff. So when he asked the local villagers, there had been a flash flood actually not flash, but a long flood, and he'd been underwater where he'd been sitting for about five or six days, submerged. He didn't know anything about it, and he was perfectly okay, totally submerged. And he was also the monk. This was, there was another lady I knew, she was a Thai princess, a, a granddaughter of one of the kings of Thailand. She became a good friend. She's dead now too, so I don't mind telling you this story. That, uh, because of the Western monks, she was married to, she, her husband went to the same school as I did in West London. And uh, she was a very good supporter of our Western monks. And so, you know, we taught her some meditation. Living in Bangkok, you know, she couldn't go to the northeast, so she went to this place, Wat Bawan. There was a meditation class by this monk every Sunday or something. And she told me, absolutely certainly, because she's a close friend, she would not lie to me. I trust that this actually happened. She was meditating there with her eyes closed and she felt really weird and strange. So she opened her eyes to take a peek. And from this Indonesian monk leading the class, she said, absolutely true, she saw rays of light coming out of his eyes into one of the other meditators helping her. Like x-ray eyes, like you may see in the movie, but this was real. And he had those powers, and I don't doubt that because I know he was a really powerful monk. The monk with the x-ray eyes. <laughs> Literally. And the reason I only say that when he's dead, because if that monk was still alive, you'd all go to Bangkok to try and look <laughs> and say, come on, show us your x-ray eyes. And he'd say, no, I won't. And he'd give him a donation. Come on, $100, $200, how much you want, show us your x-ray eyes. Because it'd be wonderful to see that. Wouldn't you like to see x-ray eyes? That'd be really cool. <laughs> but you don't show that. You don't tell about people's powers until they're dead. So it leaves them alone. So you're perfectly safe. So if you are warm, it means you're just meditating, okay? So <laughs> no, leave us alone. Don't bury us in a box, for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah? Uh, sorry, this is a great question. Just to curiosity, when Yeah. And she was actually able to describe in detail and a lot of habits which I'd forgotten and a lot of stuff that I'd forgotten. Yeah. I spoke to someone at one stage who suggested that it might have been tapping into the right spirit for the psyche. Yeah, yeah. And so I just wanted your view. Was it that? Was it my memory? Because there were things that it's like, oh my God, yeah, he used to do that. And that you know, it's like, yeah. how did she know all of these details? What was actually happening there? Yeah, I mean, it can be, she may be contacting that person. Because <laughs> m- my whole family were into mediums, they never really told me about this. Because what had happened once, it's part of my family history, my mother and uh, her cousin, they grew up as sisters. Because they were both 
my grandparents, maternal grandparents, and this woman's maternal grandparents only had one child each, a girl. So they, they hang out together, they, they went to parties together, dances together. And one day they decided, let's go and see a medium, just for, for, for a bit of fun. So they went to see this medium, and this medium told my auntie, basically my mother's sister, and she said, you're soon going to meet your husband. And this is his name. His name is going to be Donald Wolfries. That's not a common name. And she thought it was a joke. Only a few days later she was at a dance. This nice young boy asked her to dance. And I asked her this and said, what happened when you asked his name? He said it was really freaky. Can you watch your name? Donald, surname, Wolfries. And they were... And she's, uh, he's only just died about a year ago. They were married about 60 years. And that was so spooky that this medium could actually predict the name, a very uncommon name, of a man he, she hadn't met yet at all. She didn't know him. And they were going to be married for 60 years together. That was really spooky. And from that time on, you know, they always had a lot of faith in these mediums. But also, sometimes the mediums get it wrong. That's the trouble. Yeah. Oh yeah, but sometimes he might be reborn in a heavenly realm. Heavenly realm. Actually, that is so you're saying it's actually possibility. Actual possibility, heavenly realms especially. They can be around there for a long time. And it happens sometimes you're in trouble. And sometimes, you know, you feel your father's coming to help you. It's like you're in trouble and you know, he's in some heaven realm and just come to give you a, a bit of help. Yeah. Yeah, Prada, yeah. And I'm scholar one, so Yeah. But but just where that fits with the Theravada with your view. It's Antrabawa, same thing. Sorry. And they call it Antrabawa between existences. Okay. Same thing. Same. Yeah. So the state before you haven't taken birth yet, but you hang around for a bit to make sure everything's settled. Again, experience which I had uh, which shows there's hardly any difference between our traditions. There was our local treasurer, his daughter got cancer, really young. Tried everything, but you know, she took it really well. She died very beautifully. A lot of meditation, no complaints. And after she died, we did the funeral. We knew exactly the day she died, did the funeral service for her. And a few weeks later, the treasurer got the first taxi to our monastery, he arrived really early, so early. He said, what are you doing here so early? And he was spooked. Because in his house, a typical old um, Asian house, there's about 14 or 15 people lived there. You know, had the uncles and aunties and the children and the cousins. You know what it's like in the old, well, maybe, you know, Western, but ancient houses. Old family was there. Having breakfast, it's just like in old days Sri Lanka, all the food in little pots and you sit around talking to each other, having breakfast, a bit of this, a bit of that. And that's when one of his other daughters said, oh, I had a dream of you know, the daughter who died last night. She came up to me in my dream and said, no, she's been here long enough, she's now taking leave, she's going. And when the first person said that, everyone else put their spoons down and fell silent. And one by one, every person in that house without exception, about 14 or 15 of them, said they had the very same dream. The coincidence was so strong that the treasurer stopped whatever he was doing that day and came to the temple first of all, uh, you know, came to me. He said, what's going on, what's going on? And I said, she's come to take leave. And I quickly got out the calendar, because I knew all the dates when she died, and it was exactly 49 days. The 49-day rule is not just Mahayana, it's not Vajrayana. There's a case there uh, in northeast Thailand, I call it the Bible Belt of Buddhism. Been, they're really extreme sometimes up there, but 49 days was when she passed. They also have like the seven days and seven days and seven days. I don't know. Yeah, yes. Similar, similar, but in Theravada we say that's only one possibility. Sometimes it's not 49 days, sometimes immediately. Yeah, I think it's the same in the. Yeah, yeah. Seven yeah. Days, but every seven days. Every seven days is a nice thing to just you know, give another service. We do that in Theravada Buddhism as well. Sometimes 100 days. And then after that, usually every year. <laughs> Not that they need it anymore, but it's a nice way of remembering. Very good.
Any other questions before we finish off? Because it's my last talk this year, yes? Switch off, poof, God. As I said, the way that uh, it was described by the Buddha, it's like a flame which has gone out. A flame is just caused by three things, the oil, the wick and the heat. When any one of those three conditions disappears, the oil is used up, the wick is burnt up, or the wind blows the heat away, then the flame stops. And when, to make the point, the Buddha asks this wanderer, Wachagota, he says, when the flame is extinguished, where does it go? And it's, the Buddha said, it goes to the east, the west, the north or south. I'll make it more interesting. I say, if it's been a very good flame, and you know, always you know, created enough light and warm people up, if it's been a very good flame and made lots of good karma, does it go to like the heaven realm of all flames so it can live happily ever after? If it's been a bad flame and burnt people, will it go to the hell realm of flames? That's stupid, isn't it? The flame is stopped. The cause is stopped. The flame just is extinguished. So that's like the Arahat. All the causes and conditions, there's no real being here anyway, it's anatta. The causes and conditions which create this, this thing we call consciousness, which is a magician's trick, the Buddha said, and all the other parts of this thing we call a human being. All those causes and conditions have stopped, so the flame is gone. And as I said to people, the Pali Sanskrit word for a flame being extinguished is Nibbana. It was a word in common usage. In the time of the Buddha, even a young child would know the meaning of that word. Mummy, mummy, no, the oil lamp is nibbana <laughs> And they would never expect that to mean that the flame had gone to some other place. They understand it was a process which is now finished. You can't say the Arahat has gone somewhere. There's no Arahat to begin with. No, it's been destroyed. There's nothing to be destroyed. The flame hasn't been destroyed. It was just three things coming together, creating this idea of a flame. Yeah, go on. So, therefore, by extension, it's correct to say that there is some energy left from the Buddha. No, any energy left from the Buddha is the Dhamma. He who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma, but not a being. Is there any energy left from the flame? No, it's gone, finished, poof. But sometimes, uh, sometimes people get a bit, uh, a bit cheeky and they say, oh, you Buddhists, your Buddha's dead, died a long time ago. Jesus is alive. <laughs> and when they get cheeky like that, they say, oh, rubbish. Jesus was crucified. He's dead. <laughs> But, in the suttas it says, the one who sees the Dhamma, sees the Buddha. So, can you see the Dhamma today? Yes. Is the Dhamma alive today? Yes. So, so is the Buddha. So is the Gospel. The Gospel is alive, but the Dhamma, I don't know about that, but the Dhamma is alive. You can see the Buddha, you can see the Dhamma. And that is actually to say, if people get cheeky, and they try and put Buddhism down and say, no, the Buddha is alive. Because the Dhamma is alive. Making the connection between the Buddha and the Dhamma. Not the person, because it was a title given to a person. A personification, a teacher of the Dhamma. That makes sense to you, sir? Very good. Anything else? Nothing. Awareness, awareness, everything is just gone, finished. Finished, gone. But the trouble is, if ever you've read, I think it's Alice Through the Looking Glass, when Alice gets to the last <coughs> square where the Red Queen lives, the Red Queen is actually waiting for somebody else, it's waiting for a messenger. And so she asks Alice, did you uh, see my messenger on the road? And Alice says, I saw no one on the road. You saw no one on the road. You must have very, very good eyes. 
It's hard enough for me to see someone with my eyes. And soon the messenger arrives. And the messenger, uh, the um, queen said, you're really late. And he said, I, I ran as fast as I can. No one is faster than me, queen. He said, exactly, that's why no one came here before you. Because no one is faster than you. <laughs> Did you see anyone on the road? He said, no one passed me on the road. Yes, Alice saw no one too. You know, off with your head, you're too slow because no one runs faster than you. And I want the fastest person. It was making something out of a no one. A being out of emptiness. A state, a thing out of nothing. And we always love to do that. Nothing, emptiness. We make emptiness a place. <laughs> okay, too late tonight. One quick one, yeah? Um, does it really matter, you know, if you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or a Catholic or an Anglican, <coughs> if you're basically a good person? Exactly. Be a good person. <coughs> it's important as long as you're a good person right now, peaceful, wise, and you're always willing to listen to others and respect one another and help one another. That is more important. And little by little, each in our own way, we'll find our own wisdom, our own understanding. <coughs> That's the best way. And today, I wasn't talking about enlightenment. I was talking about death. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because sometimes it does where you go. When I leave here tomorrow, it's very important I go to the right place. <laughs> I'm going to Newbury Monastery, and so please don't get lost whoever takes me there. I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> sometimes that happens because our monastery in Perth is only just the next uh, thing on the, up the road is the prison. And it's happened, people get lost. And they go to the prison and say, are there any monks up here? <laughs> they think it's a monastery. Fortunately, I say no. <laughs> so, but anyway, I know where you're coming from, uh, madam. So at the moment, be good. Be peaceful, be wise. Find your own truth. Excellent. <laughs>